Over the last month, much to the chagrin of my increasingly impatient wife, I've dedicated every waking moment to exploring the rich and wondrous world of Full Metal Alchemist. It's one of the most widely celebrated animated properties to have ever come out of Japan, and I love it. It's got colorful characters, great world building, a gripping mystery, some heart-stopping action, and the perfect ending. If it wasn't for the fact that I know my wife would kill me, I'd read it again here and now. But my friends, do not worry, for I do not need to risk my life. I have found a loophole. While I can sit down and watch and read the series again like I want to, what I can do is mindlessly consume brand new content surrounding Arakawa's magnum opus. And wouldn't you know it, there's a brand new trilogy of films that are waiting for me. They've been released over the last five years and cover the whole story. Oh, whoa. okay, is that, is, is, is that real? What about that thing? Um... So it would appear to be the case that this film trilogy for Full Metal Alchemist is... Mm, live action. How bad could it be, right? Well, in the past, I've been pretty harsh on live action adaptations and beloved animated properties, but look, the last thing I want to do is spend time with my fam- I mean, uh, say goodbye to Full Metal Alchemist. Yeah, that's what I meant. So, let's give this a fair shot, and who knows? It might be an incredible adaptation, or one of the worst things my eyeballs and mind have ever endured on this hellscape. Oh my god, was that- was that foreshadowing? Couldn't be. Regardless, I mean, it's not impossible to improve upon an idea when switching mediums. It just needs to be done right. So let's see if this first film adapts the material in an appropriate way. Entitled Full Metal Alchemist, this first film was released on the 1st of December 2017 and currently sits with a rather lopsided Rotten Tomatoes score. With an awful, rough, and rotten looking 28% from critics and a significantly more impressive and fresh 71% from general audiences. And you know what? Sometimes the critics are wrong. Sometimes it's a great movie that gets a bad rap, so I'm willing to suspend my expectations, go in with an open mind, and... Full Metal Alchemist 2017. So this one is a real barrel laughs, and I mean that in both a good and a bad way. Each film generally covers one third of the mainline story, with this first installment covering the material up to Mustang vs. Lust, one of the best scenes in the series, I think, and needless to say, my expectations went through the roof. Oh god damn it. Two hours later. I have seen things I wish I never saw. And while there are of course elements from this that I did enjoy for one reason or another, there's also an unbelievably long list of things wrong with this film. So, so very long. And looking at the Rotten Tomatoes score for the other films in this trilogy, it seems like it's kind of all downhill from here. So let's have some fun and try to learn something along the way from this shared trauma bonding experience. Something I should make clear, however, at this point is that I'm convinced that live action, while it has yielded truly awful adaptations from the animated world, I don't think it necessarily needs to be that way. And what's more is, I genuinely believe that while animation has obvious advantages over live action that I will get into later on in this video, it also has disadvantages. Remember, equivalent exchange here. If there are positives, there are likely negatives associated with it too, and as I said, I will absolutely be getting into those in areas where this film shines. Seldom as those moments might be, but enough preamble, let's start the film. Well, that was fast. And honestly, I wasn't expecting to see this aspect of the story so soon. A part that wasn't revealed until much later to be shown up front to us like this is kind of disarming. And while I'm sure manga purists might be upset by this change, truth be told, at this point in the story, less than two minutes in, I was happy the director decided to rearrange the order of events presented to us because Manga and film are extremely different mediums. In the manga, the very first page demonstrates the key event that defines the entire journey Ed and Al go on together across these 27 volumes of manga. It's shocking, it's graphic, it grabs your attention, which is important when the rest of the story isn't written and you need to entice people to buy more chapters later on. However, with a film, once the ticket is paid for or the film is streamed or whatever, they pretty much have you. Unless the film turns out to be incredibly boring and weird and oh my god, I'm getting ahead of myself. But at first glance, despite the changes made, it's abundantly clear that a ton of work has gone into the cinematography, costume design, makeup and set design in order to bring this story to life. And I must say, despite the poorly done blonde hair and the two Japanese children being a little awkward, 
I think their approach to conveying what happened during the human transmutation scene and the opening credits was very impressive for a production that clearly wasn't as well funded compared to other mainstream blockbusters. Despite this, however, the film sort of begins to trip over its own lofty ambition as the runtime trickles on by approaching its own absolutely baffling conclusions, but we gotta save that for later. God, that hair looks truly horrendous, like a cosplay straight out of Comic-Con or something far more local. Okay, so this is minor, but I think it's the first sign that a certain level of care wasn't taken with this movie script. After the first scene, it's clear the director turned what was the first page into the first 10 minutes or so of the film, revealing aspects of the story that don't take shape until much later in the original run. And the issue here is that the film never bonded us to the characters, and while this thing that happened to them is awful, it's not nearly as effective at tugging on our heartstrings than it otherwise could have been. The manga, despite opening with that first page, the rest of the first chapter, and indeed the second one, demonstrates Edward and Al in all of their glory and slowly feeds us information about their past, never outright stating much but instead insinuating it through subtext. And by the time we eventually see the fabled event that took everything away from them, it breaks us and bonds us to them all the more. Because we know them. In this scene, a couple of kids go surfing through a magic... Whirlpool, I don't know, we don't know these kids either. And in this scene that follows it, in the future, the action scene is much more fun than I expected, albeit still sort of cartoonish, which is a trend for this live action film, ironically enough. But it just doesn't even begin to approach the same level of emotional weight that the animated and illustrated versions provided. There are some genuinely well shot and realized action set pieces like Ed manifesting a spear around his hand, but outside of that, it's incredibly awkward looking. This is where the cracks really start to show visually, and trust me, there's a ton more that are far worse than this. We're still only at the intro of the film, and yet this is another aspect that I think highlights the shortcomings of live action yet again, unfortunately. And honestly, it didn't need to be this way. Last month, myself and my team worked on a comprehensive multi-hour review for HBO series The Last of Us. This was a series tasked with adapting the story from one of the most beloved and popular video games of all time, and while there were sci-fi elements to it, the live-action adaptation leaned into what makes live-action effective instead of remaining a one-to-one -one with the game source material. And that, I think, is the key and the sign of a great director and writer when it comes to adapting animated material. Keep the spirit the same, but change the packaging and presentation to better suit the medium you're working with. However, with Full Metal Alchemist 2017, instead of leaning into the dark and more realistic nature of the series, it instead decided to focus on what made the series appealing in manga and anime form, resulting in some of the most cringe-inducing scenes that have made me want to crawl into my own anus. This is awful. And who is this for? In my country, this is given an age rating of 15s. Why have you decided to make a live action adaptation of a cartoon and write your characters for this live action series like cartoon characters? And it's not a cartoon, it's anime. What's the point in making it live action? It is the single most cringe-worthy approach you could take. I mean, my god. You might have noticed that I've not yet spoken about Al, by the way. Well, that's because he looks like a video game character. And hilariously, isn't in this film very much compared to the manga simply because, I assume, it was too expensive. Resulting in a severe lack of emotional chemistry between the lead actor playing Ed and the CGI Al character. And so to remedy this lack of emotional chemistry back and forth between Edward and Al and to have someone for Edward to talk to more regularly, we get more Winry. So far in this film, all we've seen is the transmutation scene. We fought all for the Cornello, minus all the parts of the story that made it emotionally meaningful to the characters. And now we get our first meeting between Edward, that looks like he's wearing a truly awful wig, and Mustang, who actually looks kind of great. And as a fan of Ron myself, I regret to inform you all that my bad writing senses were a tingling when watching this scene. 
There's nothing silly visually to look at, but man, the dialogue is clunky. And because I know where this story is going, or at least I think I do, I know that all this dialogue is here to replace events that otherwise would show us what is instead being told to us. In the manga, we came to learn of Ed and Al's current situation during a moment where they were able to teach a young girl, Rose, how to stand up and push forth for a better tomorrow for herself. No such scene takes place or replaces that one. Instead, we get an action scene with Cornello that ultimately tells us nothing beyond offering some mindless action and introducing us to the Philosopher's Stone. All in all, this exchange between Edward and Mustang is a poorly written scene if you're not familiar with the original material, but as someone who is familiar with it, it's quite frustrating and disheartening to know that I won't get to see any of the material that, you know, is used to reveal this information. So many lines that were once so effective as subtext are now being replaced with the direct and explicit lines that carry absolutely no emotional weight. But who cares about that because the casting for Hughes is frighteningly accurate. Like, holy shit! It's like they 3D printed a living human being based on Hughes's exact specifications. It's surreal. Also, why is Hawkeye's wig better than Edward's wig? Why does he look like the worst dressed person in the film? He's the lead actor. And that's including the weird immersion breaking Alphonse we have on our hands too. So much of this film either feels frantically fast because it's cramming so many different plot lines together, or extremely boring because they are talking exposition at us, or is unintentionally hilarious because it's a live action film that doesn't want to be anything other than a cartoon at times. And really, I think a big part of this film's issue is that while it's clear an unreasonable amount of work and passion had gone into it, I think it was that reverence for the source material and desire to, quote, capture the magic that paved the way for so many of these seemingly perplexing decisions to be made in the first place. And on top of that, because this is only adapting the material up to Lost vs. Mustang, they needed to figure out a way to write a story with some sort of emotional resolution. Which, spoiler alert, doesn't happen. God, I hate this movie, but I love that dog. God, he's cute. Oh, oh wait, uh, a cute, innocent girl. Adorable dog I want to make my friend. This means it's show Tucker time. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you all the image that convinced me to pick up the film in the first place. And let me tell you, I did not regret it. This is one of the funniest images I've seen in a long time. It's it's like a meme template built into the movie unintentionally. It's perfect. But this scene and section is where the wheels really start to come off the wagon and things get exceptionally silly. So typically when you adapt a work like this, which spans 27 volumes of manga, it's advisable to try to cut as much content as you can while maintaining the spirit of the property at hand. What this show does from this point is combine a ton of scenes together, do none of them correctly, along with, and this really surprised me, elements from the 2003 anime too. Just for fun, I guess. Like, the show Tucker scene, as you can see, didn't exactly strike the same fear into my soul as the original did, but in addition to that, they make show Tucker one of the main villains of the story, all the while combining his section with the Dr. Marco introduction scene, only in this one, Lost kills him. They also combine it with some elements from our first encounter with Barry the Chopper, and of course, lab number five towards the end. One of my favorite sections. Does this approach work? Absolutely not. You must be joking, but check this out. So look, I'm not going to beat around the bush here. This film is really boring in the second act, so let's skip to the parts that I actually want to talk about, where one of the most terrible choices for an ending occurs. I can get past the constant rearranging of scenes. I can deal with the emotion not really being there. I can even get on board with these sleep paralysis demons that look like they were made with all the same care as the 1998 Godzilla movie. What I cannot accept is a truly horrific misunderstanding and misrepresentation and mutilation of what was one of my favorite characters in the entire series and my favorite scene in the entire story. They do Mustang 
so dirty in this film. And while his cool fire scenes aren't nearly as cool as the anime or manga, the problem I have isn't actually anything to do with the visuals, if you'd believe it. But to catch you all up on what's happened in the movie, Tucker is freed because 2003 anime exists and we need a villain that doesn't just show up out of nowhere at the end. Ed and Al have fought and Al says some truly out of character things to his brother that he otherwise would never have done in the manga. Also, Ed fights back, another thing I don't think he'd do. They get back on the same page, Hughes is killed and Mustang is framed instead of Maria and that part's important. So at present Mustang is cornered. On one side he's facing Maria Ross as well as a bunch of armed soldiers on her side and on the other is Edward and Co. So what does Mustang decide to do? This is so dumb. This is literally every soldier involves Q to fill this guy with lead. He's given them every reason to. So why aren't they shooting? Well, I'll tell you, because the plot doesn't call for it and instead gives him enough time to reveal to everyone that Envy is disguised as Maria Ross, which only brings to the forefront how the homunculi are extremely underutilized and unexplored by this point. We've only seen one scene with them alone together or talking, and it only served the purpose of highlighting Envy's power in the first place for this very scene. Furthermore, for the the homunculi to make a mistake like this one Envy makes, it really devalues the sort of conspiracies they were capable of in the original story. I can appreciate how tough it is to create one film based on one third of a story, specifically because unlike most other long manga, this doesn't have arcs, it's one long continuous story, but man, at least try to keep it somewhat consistent. <laughs> I take it back. Keep doing this for as long as you want. All right, so Lust stabs Mustang. Alphonse is the damsel in distress because it's way too expensive to have him in the film that much. And Tucker is holding him hostage until Lust kills D Tucker. Why though? So let me tell you all the story of how this film fundamentally ruined and didn't understand the basic message behind Mustang's revenge story in the manga. You see, in the manga, Arakawa wrote this long mystery surrounding Hughes' death, and instead of Mustang being the one that was framed, Arakawa decided to frame it on his subordinate, Maria Ross. By doing so, it created the opportunity for a load more mystery and shock surrounding Mustang's application of force, supposedly taking her down. Segwaying that part of his story into killing Lust for defense of others was one thing, but he was never outright murderous in those scenes. Even when we were misdirected by the plot itself, I knew he'd never do something like that until finally, the twisted and winding path these characters are dragged down brings him face to face with the killer of his best friend. And this is where Mustang snaps. Obviously, it's awesome to see Mustang exact the same sort of revenge we all collectively want as a reader, but Hawkeye reminds him of who he is. Scar reminds him that going down this path is one he can never truly come back from if he goes through with killing Envy so cold-heartedly. And the final message of this section is, despite having all the reasons in the world to hate Envy, Mustang chooses to do the right thing. He chooses to be the best of himself. He chooses not to be ruled by hate and to instead leave envy as a blob on the floor. It's my favorite part of the entire story, but this film says fuck it and just has Mustang kill both Lost and Envy for the lulz. Like, what's even the point of the character now? Thematically, he's an entirely vapid caricature of the original that lacks any and all of the emotional messaging behind the entity that he's based on. Out of all the atrocious decisions made in this film, of which there are a dizzying amount, this is by far the most egregious. It entirely misses the point of the character, and in an effort to efficiently go through the material of the original manga in this film, the only thing they succeeded in being efficient with is assassinating Mustang's character. <clears throat> <sighs> so yeah, that's the first film, and supposedly the best one. Pray for me. Full Metal Alchemist, The Revenge of Scar. Due to what I can only assume was an outstanding box office performance from the first film in 2017, it appears the powers that be saw it fit to grant it a sequel five years later. And a third film. That same year. What? So, how does this long-awaited sequel stack up to the first film? Well, it's complicated. Uh, what we are faced with here is a fundamentally different approach to adaptation that this movie takes compared to the first. And believe it or not, I actually think it's largely for the better. In some ways, in some areas, this film still has a lot of strange stuff for sure, but largely I think we're going in the right direction. 
So what do I mean when I say a fundamentally different approach? Well, when I was watching the first film, amongst the absolute non-stop barrage of bad acting CGI, writing the whole nine yards, one element really stood out as a huge issue that brought down everything around it, an element that this sequel seemingly recognized and worked towards improving. And that element is tone. Throughout the entirety of the first film, I just could not get over how dire and depressing everything was. Full Metal Alchemist is certainly a work of fiction that never shied away from tackling darker motifs or sifting around the minutia of a character's horrific inner monologue. But what is extremely important to remember is that it was not a depressing work. Arakawa worked very hard to maintain a very specific tone, one that focused on the optimism, persistence, and oftentimes outright joy of the Elric brothers as they tried through the harsh set of circumstances set around them. That balance is deeply important. We don't weep seeing Ed react to Nina becoming a chimera just because it's sad, though it certainly is. We weep in large part because we are seeing this genuinely joyful and persistent character completely stopped in his tracks, brought to his knees and crushed. It is contrast that makes a tragedy worthwhile, not just sadness. And that is just something that the first film didn't seem to understand, amongst other baffling things. And while movie 2 still has issues, good lord does it still have its issues. I mean, if this movie was a person, they'd be committed. But however, despite that, it's clear that this sequel, at the very least, remembered that there are more than two emotions characters can portray, and the difference is immediately apparent. It isn't but seconds into the movie that we are greeted with a very different tone. After a very brief intro of Scar, who, I'm sorry, wait, is that Ryan Higa? I mean, obviously it's not, clearly it's not, but in the right light and the right angle with the hair, Scar looks like Ryan Higa during his stint as a K-pop star. Don't believe me? Look at these pictures. It looks like the same person. After that intro, we fast forward to Elle and Al hopping onto a train to Central City and are introduced to the newcomer, Ling, by way of... <clears throat> no, I'm gonna be honest. Seeing an actual, real-life human person splayed out on the floor like that, it, it, got, it got a giggle out of me. And check it out, I'm laughing at this movie for something funny they did on purpose. Literally the first time that's happened. Ed and Al's entire interaction with Ling and co are wonderfully breezy compared to the depressing slog of the previous film scenes. And I also have to say, the casting for this entire group is on point. Even as early as the first movie, the casting and costume design has consistently been a solid part of these films. And I was glad to see that still holding true. It's even improved a bit now, as Ed's hair no longer looks like the least convincing wig ever created. Unfortunately, there is very evidently a difference between onset visual design and what happens in post. And whatever happened in post for this movie, well, I'll get to that in just a little second. <coughs> now, based on my praise of this movie's tone and design so far, you might get the impression that I think the sequel could possibly qualify as a good movie in some small way. And you'd be right. I am of course joking, that is wrong. If you believe me, then you need to take a long, hard look at yourself in the mirror and then like and subscribe and watch this video. Okay, you get the point. Even though this film lands on a more faithful tone than its predecessor, that does not magically fix a complete lack of character writing, coherent visual direction, or the abundance of sheer plot insanity that takes place here. Even two movies deep now, the writing for these still struggles to deliver any sort of compelling character beats for a very wide array of different personalities. And the hilarious thing is, you might be thinking, damn, live action sure does ruin anime. And the thing is, 99% of problems with this film have nothing to do with the format, ironically enough. Turning this live action film into an animated production wouldn't change very much at all. I mean, I've spent over four hours with movie Al at this point, and I feel more familiar with the cashier lady at my grocery store, shout out Mary. And time and time again, this movie tends to sprint through important character development because it simply doesn't have time to establish what are the fundamentals of storytelling. Making for a bad story, shockingly enough, it has nothing to do with the medium. Like, take this for example. After some wacky action on the train with Ed and Ling, Lanfan blows up the train. Weren't they just trying to get information about immortality and the Philosopher's Stone from Ed? It seems like such a weird and extreme thing to do that just doesn't track at all with the internal logic of the scene. But I guess, 
when you have just a couple of minutes to introduce these characters, establish their goals, stage a train heist, and then derail the train literally, I guess consistent character writing just kind of naturally goes off the rails. I'm very sorry for that. So after over two hours of non-existing on screen previously, we are finally introduced to President Bradley. And honestly, he looks pretty sick too. Casting once again spot on. And while Bradley is chilling and looking all important, the military guys behind him can seem to restrain an already restrained, tied up group of bad guys. What is going on? I okay, I have to say this, pause. What the hell is with these guards and soldiers? They just absolutely suck. They suck hard. And you will see that it becomes a bit of a trend in this film. I'm not gonna get into it too much, but they just fuck up so much in this film. Anyways, Ed and Al are very, very quickly briefed on the Scar situation, and then they take off into the city alone because I guess that's just how they roll. They then immediately stumble upon May. Once again, I will humbly admit that uh, it got a bit of a laugh out of me seeing her splayed out on the ground like that. And as soon as May is resuscitated and fed, Ed ends up chasing after her for totally legitimate reasons. I don't know. And would you know it, she happens to run directly into our old pal Scar. I mean, like, immediately run directly to him by pure coincidence. And wouldn't you know it, at the very same time, a random soldier just so happens to be yelling Ed's full legal name and title within earshot of Scar, so that he can now know that Ed is an alchemist. I... I really wish I was making all of this up. It's hard to imagine how something this ridiculous and amateurish made its way through a real life writer's room. Like someone read this and thought, yep, that looks good, let's print that. Now I'll spare you the details of the CG fight fest that ensues later on, but the Scar fight does the most, and I do mean the most important thing in this entire movie's runtime. And that is introduce live action Armstrong. Folks, I won't mince words with you. Not only is Armstrong the funniest fucking thing I have seen all week, but I'm going to go so far as to say that his character design is the perfect microcosm of this film's entire approach. If you want to understand this movie, just look at his weird head. Like, on the one hand, I don't think anyone can knock the way this person looks as being inaccurate to the character he's based on. That certainly is Armstrong. I mean, it quite literally cannot be anyone or anything else. In fact, the vast majority of this movie is deeply invested in honoring its source to its dying breath. Its dying, gasping, mutilated breath. Armstrong looking like that, characters splayed out on the ground, Ed literally shaking when being called short, even all the wacky silliness of Ed trying to lure Scar out later on. The entire movie is completely unabashed in its dedication to its anime source material. And that is both a good thing and a horrible thing. <laughs> On the one hand, I think it's important to retain the element of the work that made it so successful in the first place. So often anime or video game live action movie adaptations are almost embarrassed of their origins and tend to adapt themselves so far away from their source material that the soul of their work is completely lost in translation. And that's obviously not good. But on the other hand, <laughs> it might be just as bad to completely ignore the strengths and more importantly weaknesses of a given medium when creating an adaptation. Neil Druckmann, creator of The Last of Us, like I mentioned before, recognized this very fact when working on creating the live action adaptation of his game. While mowing down hordes of zombies is super fun and totally works in a video game context, watching a real life human being mow down dozens of zombies and kill and mutilate hundreds of just way too many like living people is deeply unhinged. And to that same end, so many of the tendencies and tropes of anime just look outright silly in this movie. I'm supposed to be emotionally engaged in a tragic scene of Armstrong holding a literal dead body of a deceased child on the battlefield, but I mean, just look at him. All I do is in real life out loud laugh at this, and I'm assuming that's not what they're going for here. So all in all, I think the more lighthearted and anime approach this movie took is actually a net positive, but it is only a net positive because the first movie was so deeply unenjoyable to begin with. With this second movie, I might still not give a single shit about almost every single emotional beat or character in its given runtime, but at least I'm having a good laugh along the way, right? So, anyway, 
and head back to Pinaco's place for repairs, and we cram a whole lot of different plot elements and moments into this tiny trip. Mindy. Now sporting her iconic outfit this time around, which means I am once again subject to the sadistic torture that is watching her and Ed <sighs> flirt. Please, God, make them stop this LARP scene right now. At the same time, we also cram in Hohenheim reuniting with Ed in his trip. And while I must once again give it up for some pretty stellar casting and costume design for Hoho, I still can't escape the feeling that so many of the character motivations in this series are completely and utterly yada yada away into obscurity. The passing and failed resurrection of the Elric's mother still feels like a total footnote. And when the central motivation and inciting incident of your story feels like that, that's when you know know your screenplay has failed. Now, of course, in keeping with the same spirit, as soon as Ed is all fixed up, he heads straight to the desert Ishval land because, well, I don't know why. It's never really explained in the film, just deal with it. I mean, you've seen the anime, right? So you know why he's there. Is that good enough? Not really, but we gotta move on. At uh, one metric unit of exposition later, and Ed is all caught up on the history of Scar and the Rock Bells and takes off back to Central City. What a quick and so very unexplained detour. Like, it really makes me wish I hadn't seen or read the original series before this, because I feel like watching this without any context prior from the original material would leave you so completely lost. Uh, but yeah, anyway. Once there, he runs into Salem Bradley himself and... Oh God. While I didn't predict this, this kid was said pride, he was, quote, quote her, pride, pride and joke. Like, like, Ooh, there is the little bastard, there he is! <clears throat> Once there, Ed and Al meet up with Ling and hatch a plan to lure out Scar and thus a homunculi to capture. And honestly, the subsequent sequence of Ed being friendly neighborhood alchemists might have actually completely changed my tune on live action Ed altogether. It's all very anime, but in a way that is actually kind of charming and endearing. The entire sequence, and really the rest of the movie by and large, plays out almost exactly like the manga. Scar chases Ed, Ling owns the homunculi, has an unfortunate run-in with Bradley, and Winry walks in right in time to find Scar as the one that killed her parents or something, yeah. It's all exactly what you'd expect if you were familiar with the story, but one thing this sequence does do that is completely unique is manage to have an emotional moment land. <laughs> The entire scene with Winry contemplating shooting Scar and then Ed jumping in front of her to stop her is done so well, it's it's almost disarming. And that's not a pun here, okay? <laughs> disarming, not a pun, disarming, okay, whatever. For but a brief moment, as I watched Ed trigger a powerful flashback to Scar's brother defending him, I almost forgot how bad the rest of these films are. Who snuck this actual film into my anime live action parody? In truth, I find it hard to quantify why this scene works for me, while every single other emotional scene in this series fell flat. Maybe it's the legitimately good performances. Maybe it's the complete lack of atrocious CG. Maybe it's Maybelline. Whatever the case, despite all the odds, it's probably the best scene in the entire series so far, and it really makes me wish the rest of the movie would have reached these heights rather than being stuck in the proverbial mud. And speaking of the proverbial mud, I glanced over the single best visual spectacle of the entire movie. Maybe in all of cinema history. You see, as they were escaping the nefarious clutches of President Bradley, Lan Fan resourcefully throws a flashbang grenade to blind her foe. And as the stock Adobe After Effect light effect graces our screens, we are treated to Bradley throwing a sword at the two with his PNG powers. Just look at it. Ling clearly is not as amused by Bradley's PNG power as I was because I was inconsolably laughing. I fell off my chair. I hurt myself. This film hurt my sides so bad from laughing that I'm now going to retroactively give both the first film and this film certified 10 out of 10. I'm going to register myself as a critic on Rotten Tomatoes just so that there's a registered critic that says this film's a 5 out of 5 or 100% or certified fresh. I mean, just look at this. Okay. Okay. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Gluttony is on screen, and with the power of some grenade no jutsu, Ed and Co. manage to tie up Gluttony just like the manga. And just as I mentioned before, while this is accurate to its source material, it is just really hard to get past how goofy this looks in real life. But honestly, at this point, I've embraced it. You go, Ling, toss the blobby body sphere into the boot of your car. 
At the same time, Scar is completely neutralized by Hawkeye with her impressive feat of sh shooting him with a pistol. Uh, that's all it took? What about the entire line of soldiers earlier with the guns aimed at Scar? What happened to them? Why didn't they shoot him? They could have. He's just a guy. That clearly would have done the trick. At this point, we hit a large 30 minute stretch of content that is frankly hard to even talk about. I mean, in part because it's all covering the elements of the manga with note to note accuracy, but also in part because it's just all sort of the same fare. If I describe one of the scenes to you, I will have described them all to you. From Land Fan's recovery, to teasing father, to the entirety of the Ishvel Civil War flashback, of which received surprisingly sufficient runtime, it all just sort of begins to blend together. I am very well known amongst my co-workers as someone that takes extensive notes with consuming media for this channel, and I only managed to take one single note for this entire 30 minute segment, and those notes were, and I quote, blah 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 boring. No, I'm paraphrasing of course, but you get the picture. The entire thing is one amalgamous glop of largely poor filmmaking. The writing is lackluster. The acting is unremarkable. The character beats, they're not there. Character interactions hand wave. The CG is atrocious, but hilarious. And in fact, almost the entirety of the Civil War flashback takes place against a very, very unconvincing green screen. I'm sure it might sound like I'm just glossing over all of this out of laziness or maybe for the sake of time, but it really is just that the whole thing is uninteresting. I mean, watch it for yourself and tell me I'm wrong. I finished watching the movie less than two hours ago and I'm already having to recheck footage just to remember literally anything of note in this section. And in the big picture, that is the largest sin of this entire film because unlike the first movie, which was just so incredibly boring from start to finish, this sequel was at least entertaining me up until this point. It lulled me into a false sense of security. It certainly wasn't a good movie, but it was kind of fun and kooky to watch. But now, suddenly, I'm back to being super bored again, causing me to check the time marker in the movie to see how much time is left before I can stop watching it. It's hard to imagine a more clear-cut indicator of a movie's failure at that point. In any case, at the end of it all, we find Ed once again standing off against Scar, for some reason, and the fight is surprisingly anticlimactic. Scar is still partially wounded from his very traumatic pistol wound. <laughs> And so, after a good 20 seconds of getting tiny rocks thrown at him, he decides to pull his favorite trick and escape by destroying the ground beneath him and being crushed by the rubble. I mean, escaping below safely and in a very normal, natural way that has no problems attached to it at all. Except gasp! Ed and Al were planning for that all along, and Al was waiting for him below to trap him. Except double gasp! Scar was planning for their planning of his plan, and he actually destroyed the whole building. Except triple gasp! He immediately gets distracted by Winry walking up like a dog getting distracted by a squirrel, and Ed just simply runs up and kicks him. Thankfully, for the sake of this movie's runtime, as well as my sanity, he lands from the kick with his fighting arm perfectly positioned and outstretched so that Ed can tie it up in a neat little bow. How cute and thoughtful of him. This gives Winry the chance to have her heart to heart with Scar and bandage him up, just like in the manga. It's, it's, it's not great, but it's there. And let's be fair, it certainly is one of the scenes of all time. But on the bright side, after bandaging Scar, the movie makes sure we get the message of the scene and has her parents approvingly appear before her as ghostly apparitions for <laughs> Return of the Jedi style. My mind is melting talking about this guy, seriously. I mean, I'm really not sure if I'm going to make it to the end of this trilogy in One Piece. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, since this is a trilogy, we can't just resolve the story here. I need some sort of inciting incident for the third movie to follow. God save me. So lo and behold, Gluttony arrives. Scar heroically saves her and the heroes escape. At least until literally 10 seconds later where Scar is incapacitated. <laughs> we are treated to one final once again, surprisingly short fight that culminates in Gluttony eating Ling, Ed, and Envy via the power of being the dumbest character in the history of man. And the movie leaves off with our beloved hero stuck in Gluttony's stomach, facing off against the true Envy in all of its glory. God, it looks horrible. <laughs> Look, uh, like I said before, I actually do think there is a decent amount to enjoy in this film. And unlike the first movie, a good chunk of it was actually on purpose, which is nice. The casting, set design, musical score, costume design, and even a lot of the acting was very enjoyable in one way or another. And I found myself largely entertained for at least the first two thirds of the movie. 
But even at its best, it was sort of an ironic enjoyment, an almost campy glee at seeing anime tropes and sensibilities brought to life so unabashedly and hilariously. And at its worst, I was right back to throwing my hands into the air in frustration as nonsensical writing allied itself with CG so bad I thought I was watching Food Fight. My main hope, above all, is that somehow the third movie upholds the tonal improvements of this film while also delivering a legitimate story with actual stakes and character writing. But of course... <clears throat> well, yeah. <laughs> Next time on Full Metal Alchemist. <laughs> you chill, I'm tired. <laughs> AJ's bullshit. But I... But I... Yeah, Oh god, this is good. This is gonna be a tough one. Okay. Yeah. <sighs>